This is your coffee break. Well, hi, Randall. Well, hello, Sarah. It's wonderful to have you on the show today. For all of you listening out there, I have with me today on the show Randall Green, who is a published author and is local to the area. So we're doing this in person, which I'm really excited about. And I will just let him go ahead and introduce himself. Hi, I'm Randall Eldon Green. I'm the author of Descriptions of Heaven, uh, published by Harvard Square Editions. Um, Came out November last year. Uh, This is actually my first live interview. What? Um, Yeah, my first live interview. I've done, you know, interviews, uh, you know, online, basically emailing back and forth. Sometimes it's a questionnaire, sometimes it's a conversation. So this is going to be a lot more fun doing this extemporaneously. I can't really... (laughs) formulate my thoughts into writing while sitting here with you so I know it's gonna be interesting well, it is hope, well you know and that's what we hope for here at the right now podcast interesting but in a good way not like when your mom makes something to eat and you're like oh this is interesting so <laughs> so let's just jump right in you have with you a copy of your book yes yes tell me all about it all about it well it's about a linguist a lake monster and the looming shadow of death alliteration i appreciate (laughs) there's a lot of alliteration in the book um a a lot of people who have read it a lot of the early reviewers called it uh poetic and it 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 is that's that's a, a lot of what it is the main character robert he's the narrator and he's uh very very literate in in this poetic way the way he describes things um but you know the book is a lot about language it's a it's about death it's about language it's about both the attempt of language to try to explain these particular mysteries and its inadequacies in doing so even though he reaches as he goes throughout the book for bigger and more obscure words he heaven still remains obscure to him interesting yeah so um it's uh he he's a a, has a small family his wife natalia who is the one dying of cancer and then his uh son jesse i I believe he's like uh, six or seven at the the beginning of the novel there um as you see it's a it's a rather short it is novel would you call it a novella i i do call it a novella usually novella short novel um, I'm not sure what Harvard actually calls it. All they know is they, they liked it. So <laughs> You know what? And that in itself is a compliment. So tell me how you got connected with Harvard. Oh, well, um, well, I, I quit. This is going to be a longer story about the whole writing journey for me. But... You know what? This is great because I love asking authors about the writer's journey as well. So just tell us all. <laughs> okay, well, um, I quit. Uh, got a job after college at a call center and, you know, doing that stuff because I have like a degree in English and anthropology, which doesn't really do anything until you go to grad school. And anyway, so I'm working at this call center and then I get an idea for a wonderful book. And so I quit my job and start, uh, you know, writing full time. I I find a weekend gig at a hotel Mm -hmm. um, because I figured I'd be able to write at a hotel and I'd have some free time and I admit to the lady who's interviewing me, you know, hey, this is what I, I want to do. I'm quitting this job so I can write. And she's like, oh, good. Do you want to work two days a week? You can work just Saturdays and Sundays, but we'll we'll do 16 hour shifts. And I was like, yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. yes. So so that that worked out really well. So um, now I have all this free time and I don't spend as much of it writing as, you know, because it's so much free time, I can't spend all of it writing. Mm. And I end up sending out this thing that I wrote, this little book, Descriptions of Heaven, and uh, to about 30 different places over a week. And then I just let it go and keep writing, keep having fun, socializing. And then all of a sudden I start getting these beautiful rejection letters back. Oh, yes. You know, they're just like, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden I get three acceptance letters. Um, and one of them I decided not to go with because I looked at what other authors had said Mm. about them. I was like, "Mm, no, uh, another one of them said, you know, when they found out it was Harvard Square Editions, they're like, uh, no, we're not going to take you Mm. because Harvard's going to treat you way better and have more resources. So, and that left Harvard Square Editions. 
and that, that's how I ended up with them. But you see, I had a whole other book I was working on suddenly, and then I had to put it down to <laughs> start marketing out this guy and start editing it, so. Tell me all about that process. Um, frustrating. Yes. Um, and I learned so much in the process, though. It's learned so much about, you know, grammar rules that were a little obscure to me. I know how to use them now. Um, uh, Martine Bellin was the editor that I went with. Um, she did a fantastic job. Yeah, I pulled out my hair once in a while, yeah, yeah. you know, being like, why did she change that beautiful long sentence? It was only two pages long. I think that's your answer, <laughs> but go on. And then, uh, and you know, she, you know, she had a lot of good points, even where uh, I disagreed with the edit she made, she knew that that part needed changed. Um, so that's why it was just wonderful working with an editor and even when I rejected her she had a great point and uh, you know I recently read a self-published uh, book um, called Lost Boys and you know and, and I wrote, a, wrote the author back because you know she sent this to me to mm. review for this thing I want to write and I was like you know Allie you need an editor and she's like really no one ever told me that about this book. I've had a few people read it. And lo and behold, she's getting an editor. I'm super excited now. Good. So. Good. That's a good influence. Yeah, yeah. I like that you did that. That's uh, important. Yeah. I, and I just don't know if people weren't honest with her, but, uh, you know, my editor was honest with me and that was wonderful. She said she liked the beautiful writing. Um, you know, I had, I, I'm a fan of the long sentence, but she helped me break some of those down. Um, you know, that was still maybe a complaint some people had is that the, the language was a bit, uh, bit long. I like that you were willing to go to an editor because it, it is hard to find people who say no to you or who push back against you. Yes. And I've dealt with that myself with people who just are yes people and they love you and they want you to, you want, you know, they're like, Hey, you're writing this book. I love it. And they just can't criticize it. So. That's that's really good that you went outside of your your box and just had it edited. Oh yeah, I, I don't know if it's so much out of my box because you know outside of editors, I probably had for how short this mm -hmm. novella is, um, way too many proofreaders for it. Oh. Um, well, and, and part of that, I think I mentioned this in my acknowledgments, is I asked a whole bunch of people to read the the book because most of the time I want a short story edited. Uh, you know, or at least a proofreader. I have to ask like eight people, and I might get one or two who say yes, but almost everyone I asked said yes, so I had quite cool. a few there. So. Good. What did you do in the? Did did they ever have any opinions that jarred or that didn't uh, that didn't agree with each other? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, with each other. Oh. Um, I I suppose because uh, you know some of my readers that I I, I chose some people that didn't really read a whole lot of, you know, literary fiction, just to see what their take on it was. And then, uh, you know, most of the people I happen to know went to college and, you know, had English courses. So, yeah, they, they knew what they were looking for. But um, I also tried to choose some people that were definitely genre writers, some people that weren't really writers, they're just readers, and mm. to see what they thought. And um, I, I don't remember them really having clashing opinions with each other but sometimes they would just find the most different things to criticize or critique you know and one of them's like oh you should say that the lake monster is the cancer i was like well actually it's not <laughs> oh. read this right that, that's not the metaphor I'm, I'm using here but um you know that was maybe the only one that i was like oh no you got that wrong <laughs> But, you know, otherwise, word choice or, you know, things like that, just different things that people pulled out. I do recommend, if you like proofreaders, find a lot of people. Um, and I did the same thing with the book reviewers. I, I found, you know, a book reviewer in high school, and I found a book reviewer who, you know, has done a whole bunch of stuff for Colorado Review and everything in between. So just... You know, what are these different people's opinions on my book? And I know I'm going to get some bad reviews, and I did. Yeah. And I was totally okay with that. So anyone listening to this podcast now who gave me, like, a one-star rating, 
I'm okay with you. We're, <laughs> we're still BFFs. I appreciate that you're saying that. I actually, so my podcast just got its first two-star review on iTunes. And like my heart broke a little bit, but you know what? If you're listening, whoever you are, I also still, I, I still love you. Yeah, maybe they misclicked or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm willing to accept that uh, this is not for everyone, which is okay. It sounds like, you know, a lot of times people talk about being a writer as, as being very isolated. It sounds like you have a huge network of people, your readers, editors, all sorts of things. Tell me about your writing network. Oh, gosh, my, my writing network. Um, really, it's just friends in the arts. Um, and I am a writer, and I am a bit of a recluse. I, I, a, lot of, a lot of this is Facebook friends, uh, you know, people that I'm willing to read their stuff, mm-hmm. they're willing to read my stuff. Um, I also, they're the same friends, I'm also like, you need to write more, I want to read more of your writing. Uh, you know, and a lot of them were surprised when they ended up in the acknowledgments because it was so long from when they proofread the book <laughs> to when it came out. They're like, really? I'm in the acknowledgments? That's cool. I'm like, yeah. And you want to buy a copy? <laughs> <laughs> you want to buy 10? <laughs> you want to buy 10? <laughs> wink, wink. So you quit your job to write. Yes. Okay. Tell me about that. I know that is the dream for so many of my listeners. Like, number one dream quit my day job, write full time, get published. You're living the dream. Tell me about that. Living the dream, <laughs> wow. Um, I, I guess it's living the dream. It's, uh, it, it puts writing in a very different perspective. I used to, uh, I worked evenings before, so I'd get up really early and I'd sit there very groggy at my desk and I'd um, try to, to write and you know, I got some short stories done, I I got this little book done, so that worked out well for me, but then quitting the job and suddenly having all this time to write, um, it can actually be a bit daunting because suddenly you're expected to do this, you are living the dream of leisure, Mm. and there's definitely that pull there, like, oh, you have free time, and in all honesty, all I want to do is sit and write. And everyone else says, oh, you're free. Oh. And everyone else prioritizes this time you've set aside for composition as time that's open, ended. But it's really not. And that's yeah. so hard to say no to the people you love, to the friends you love to hang out with, and actually just become a bit of a recluse and sit down and write for those hours. Um, So it was a bit hard managing that. I don't think I ran off any friends. Um, (laughs) You know, I I now live in Sioux City where I don't know as many people. A lot of my friends have moved away and it's more of the staying in touch online. But uh, so, so I don't have those problems anymore. But I'm always trying to you know, tweak my schedule to get a little bit more writing, a little bit more learning, a little bit more, uh, you know, just leisurely reading uh, into my day. So you mentioned learning. I want to know, do you do courses? Do you just read a lot? Do you find articles about publishing or marketing? What do you do to keep educating yourself? Oh, gosh. Um, I I invested in a, a great courses, uh, you know, I'm sure almost everyone's probably heard of that. Uh, want to study Latin, so finding time for that. And I absolutely love learning a new language. I'm not good at it. That's okay. Necessarily. Well, who is? You know, I'm I'm no linguist. Uh, <laughs> not uh, like your. Not like Robert okay. in this novel. He he gave me a run for for my words. He made me work for them because he. His vocabulary is way better than mine. <laughs> These are definitely not my words. But, um, uh, you know, learning Latin, I, right now in the morning, um, I've figured out that I seem to write better if I don't read fiction in the morning, but if I do some reading. So mm-hmm. right now I'm going between um, nonfiction, you know, there's so many different things with nonfiction. So it could be a, a history book, it could be an art book, um, uh, a book of essays. I, I love reading essays. Um, and then and then reading a book of poetry. And I'm just kind of going back and forth with that, uh, going from one to the other. And you'll read for an hour, hour and a half in the morning, and then I'll, I'll write. And then um, 
and then I will, in the evenings, try to spend some time learning. That is unstructured time, and it's a lot more hit and miss, but like I said, tweaking my schedule, maybe someday I will get through all the Latin lessons. <laughs> How many are there? Like, are you like 10% the way through, or like... 50. You know, I'm not sure. I think there's uh, 12 lessons, but, uh, you know, I could be wrong about that. So they, they come on CDs. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, not not really sure. Um, one of the new things I'm doing, though, is that, you know, living at home, I'm recently married. I got married in January. Congrats. Wow. That's yeah. That's very recent. Yeah. So, and I've been, you know, my wife, Libby, works full time, you know, she's a school teacher, she uh, teaches English language learners, uh, you know, so she's kind of the breadwinner for the household, and it's because I'm not really selling a whole lot of books yet. <laughs> um, understandable, I'm a new author, no yeah. one's heard of me. Uh, but what, I'm, what I've realized is that I used to be able to just write at my desk just fine. But every time I go walk down the stairs to get a cup of coffee and come back up, I, I feel like that creative valve gets shut just a little bit more, a little bit more. And it took me a few months to realize that, oh, what, what's going on here? Oh, every time I walk through the house, I see all the chores that are allocated oh. to me. And it's sort of just stopping that creative flow a little early. So uh, recently, I went to almost every cafe I could find in Sioux City. Um, anything within walking distance, because I love to walk. I'd be willing to walk, in, you know, about an hour to a cafe if needed, because that doesn't bother me. Uh, so I, I walked around to about every cafe, and you know, one thing I can't stand is too loud of music or the wrong kind of music. I, I hear other people's voices. You had a wonderful podcast about oh, music, by thank the way. You. <laughs> um, uh, you know, hearing hearing all these other lyrics and you know, really can disrupt the words I want to put down onto paper. So mm -hmm. uh, I found a cafe that doesn't have music. They don't even have a sound system, but, oh, they have a TV that's oh. blaring daytime television. Oh, that's so, worse. Yeah, and it was really loud, so the so the manager in the back who's working back there could oh. keep up with her daytime talk. So I was like, okay, not this cafe. And then I found the one. The it one. was Yeah, the one. It's really close to home. Uh, and one thing I didn't realize that I really needed that none of the other cafes had outside, of this, this place has live music, uh, right at lunchtime, they have live music. Um, this whole staff was so friendly. Uh, she wants, the, the manager saw me writing there and asked about it and right away said, oh, you need to come do a reading here. And I'm like, this place is wonderful. And the one thing that was missing from every other cafe was simply refills mm -hmm. on coffee. All the others, you would buy coffee, didn't matter if it was black, went in one to-go cup and you had to buy every time you needed a refill. Oh, she just came by with the pot and oh. just poured it right in. I'm like, this is perfect. Bless her heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I love that she invited you to come do a reading. Yes. That's that says a lot. I mean, and then does she is she say like, oh, this is our writer in residence? Like, <laughs> we haven't done the the, the reading yet, but I, I could tell she was very excited to have a writer in her cafe just sitting there composing. I, I'm not sure how long this cafe's been there, um, but I, I know it's it's called the Blue Cafe in Sioux City, and the proceeds from that cafe actually go to the conservatory, the music conservatory there people who were walking in there were in the arts and stuff and they knew the staff I'm just like yeah this is this is that's a nice kind of place. perfect that's kind of perfect <laughs> so shout out to the with the blue cafe the is that blue what it's called cafe, yes. go there and write maybe you'll run into Randall while you're there <laughs> you might <laughs> or maybe you won't because he's an introvert and he'll hide from you I can't guarantee <laughs> I might be the guy in the corner looking down at a piece of paper and pulling his hair out being like what <laughs> I'm nodding because I understand that so much yes oh my gosh yeah so much of writing is just just staring off into space. I, I could, I was facing the door the, the last time I was there and I, I could tell uh, one old couple walked in, the woman thought I was staring at her. Oh. I was like, no, there are characters walking in front of you. Trust me, they're there. You can't see them. <laughs> so tell me a little, you mentioned earlier about the linguist having words of his own, this character having words of his own. Tell me how you, uh, how you work with characters. And I feel like this is something that a lot of writers experience. The characters come alive on their own. You don't really have any control over them. Tell me how, uh, how you deal with your characters. Oh, I, I have to give them uh, free reign, uh, even when 
they aren't the narrator, which usually they're not. It, you know, Robert does narrate this book, but usually they're not the narrator, but you just kind of got them got to give them free reign to do what they want, not what I want them to do. I don't need to lead them with the plot, uh, sort of what you're asking, right? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and the follow-up to that was, do you outline beforehand? Do your characters take you away from your outline? Do you just write by the seat of your pants? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I wouldn't say I outline, but um, one thing I usually start most everything I write with uh, most everything I write, I start with the last sentence. I usually know where I'm leading to, and I don't know how I'm going to get there. So it's usually a last sentence or even a last scene, and that's how Descriptions of Heaven started. Interesting. I, I knew exactly where I wanted it to go, but I, I didn't even know what the story was I, when I started it. I just knew there was this beautiful scene and said, well, what is this? And the scene had characters, and then uh, okay, well, who are these people? And then from who these people are, the story you know, blossomed around it and made this beautiful little tragedy. This is awesome. You're the only person, I've, or the first person, I guess, that I've talked to uh, who has started with the end. Yeah, I do that with almost everything, though. Uh, you know, the short stories, this, this book. Uh, um, I have another book in progress, and with that one, I do have the last scene, but um, I have all these post-it notes all over the desk, and... Uh, they're just fragments, lines. I don't outline, I just have lines, and I know I gotta get to it. Now some of them I'm like, I know this line belongs to this particular scene in the book, um, you know, or series of related scenes, but some of them, I don't even know what they are. But, you know, they're slowly finding their way into the book. I like that. How did you develop your method? I developed my, my method by being a young high school poet who uh, sort of compulsively wrote every second he could get. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that go through any of like my math notebooks, you'll find almost as much poetry as math. Um, I, even in, in the shower, I had a, a drawer that had a pen and, and paper just in case I had an idea. And yes, there are some <laughs> wet you know, ink blobs of writing that later became poems. Um, not a good poet. That's okay. And, but, you know, that's what started me with a lot of my writing, a lot of this, you know, pseudo-confessional poetry. And I, I want to put that in quotes because high school poetry is an attempt. It's a learning thing, but it's definitely not a finished product. <laughs> I'm sure there's some young geniuses who are going to, you know, write their masterpiece by the time they turn 19. But, uh, you know, I think Heart of Darkness was like that. I, I could be wrong. I know that Keats, when did Keats die? Didn't he die when he was 17 or 18? Oh, okay. Was it? Was he that young? Well, oh. See, maybe I'm getting it mixed up. I know Rambeau uh, quit when he was 17 and moved to Africa. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're out there, the, you young geniuses. The young geniuses are, are out there. So maybe maybe the, the young uh, polyglot and the, the young, uh, you know, intellectual who's multi-talented yeah I, I really liked what you said earlier about working with this quote-unquote free time that other people perceive as free time and actually for you is work time how many hours a day would you say you spend writing slash staring off into space which is also <laughs> writing um, recently it's been uh, about three hours a day and you know at my peak I was writing four or six hours um, it all kind of varies you know with what's going on in life. Uh, the holidays, hmm. horrible for writing. Uh, one of the things I've found that I need to do is not put off those days that I do have free to write because life will keep going on. Things will keep happening. You know, this week I have extra hours at work because you know a co-worker's you know close relative passed away so I don't know what my writing's gonna look like I got to work with her and the funeral arrangements things like that are gonna happen uh, you know suddenly getting engaged happened Congrats. <laughs> yes and then <laughs> married and uh, so yeah things are gonna keep rolling down and if you say oh you know I'm gonna take this day for myself okay, maybe once in a while, but if it becomes a habit, you find yourself not having any writing time. So 
Yeah, I'm trying to write as much as possible. Like right now, it's two to three hours. Um, you know, part of that is uh, these extra hours I've been having at, at work. Part of that was the marriage. And um, part of that is the cafe is open 11 to 2. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so um, so I'm what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, just uh, today, actually, uh, I just finished a short story project and an essay project. And I'm like, what do I want to work on next? Um, I don't want to hop right back into that novel in progress. Right now, that's on hold. Uh, I, I have this short story collection idea. So I sat down today, looked at what I had written for it, what pieces of it are already published. I've got like three of the stories published already and um, kind of wrote down an outline of an action plan. I'm going to work on this story, then this one, then this one, and I'm going to do that at the cafe. And before I go to the cafe, I'm going to work on scripting for that uh, Canon Critics project that I, um, Mike and I talked to you about before we started recording. So that's the plan right now. I love this. I love that you have so many projects in motion. When you write your short fiction, the novel that you've published, the novel you're working on, are they all literary fiction? Or are they... Yes, they're they're all literary fiction. Now, once in a while, I write something that's a little out there. It might be considered more sci-fi-ish or fantasy. I mean, there's a lake monster in this book, yeah, for goodness know. sakes. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm a fan of magical realism or things that sort of toe the line between genre and non-genre. Um, you know, if literary fiction is considered non-genre, yeah, it, that's the thing I love about literary fiction. And I'm just like, you know, it subsumes just whatever's good. It just sort of hugs it and says, come yeah. into the family. Yeah. <laughs> So the novel you're working on now, you have on hold while you're working on a short story collection. collection. Yes, yes, exactly. So, and part of that is there's just a backlog of short story ideas mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, the pressure's kind of been pushing for that. And I'm like, you know, right now in between projects, I think that this will be a good one to sort of just release some of that, that creative steam. What a great metaphor. I like that. I also like the metaphor you used earlier about that creative faucet, you know, getting slowly oh, turned off yes. as you realize all the chores and work that you have to do. I have this feeling, and it might be wrong, but you seem like the type of writer who does not run into writer's block very often. No, I, I, maybe I can be sympathetic, but I am not really truly empathetic with that. I, I, I don't really know what writer's block is. It hasn't happened to me yet. Um, I've I've tried to talk to you know I've I've ran some creative writing groups and stuff in the past and I said well it doesn't matter if you have the muse or not because that's something I hear so often it's like I'm just waiting for the creative muse and I'm like is that I think that's the thing you develop when you are writing enough to get into the flow and if you aren't writing you won't learn to tap that flow um, so you don't wait for the muse you write anyways and you know what. Most of the time, it doesn't matter whether I was in the flow or not, the writing looks just as good. Yep. You know, she can be, the muse can be singing in my ear or not. It's beautiful. She's invited. I like it when she's there. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, she, she doesn't have to be for me to be writing creatively. I appreciate you saying that. I've been uh, struggling with that myself. Understanding for me, realizing that uh, what I've been calling writer's block is really just a mixture of procrastination and fear and all of these things that, you know, you don't really want to admit to yourself that you're feeling. And so you're like, writer, writer's block, that's what I'm calling it. Not that it's not legit for some writers, but for me personally, like, you know, and yeah. some, and self doubt's are okay. That's, that's a definite reason for a lot of writer's block, self doubt. And, uh, and there's an interesting form of writer's block that I, I think it, the term for it is world building. Um, I, I know some people that have fantastic ideas for epic fantasies that I would love to read someday, but you know, the, their form of writer's block is continually um, finding new variations and more detailed explanations for their world building. And I'm like, you know what, that's what your fans are for. And you got to get the story out first. Yes. You got to get the plot out first before you can expand into this huge, you know, Tolkien-esque world. Amen. Amen to that. Yes, that is very true. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Like just writerly topics on your mind, other things? 
<sighs> topics on my mind. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so many topics. Um, I might be a bit of a blank. If you're, and if you're here, let me just like spring this on you, sure. you know, because you're an introvert. I'm, you won't believe it. I'm also an introvert. I just um, get excited when I talk to people. So like later I'm going to go home and like hide under the blankets for 10 hours. But like right now I'm, I'm good. Right. Isn't that the thing with, with introverts is that they, they're the people that really like to talk because they don't normally get to talk to anyone. Um, you know, and it's not like a hat that they wear. Where they're like, I want to be that existential guy who's super mysterious. If if that's if that's what you want to be, you're probably not really an introvert. Like, if it's something you need to get away from once in a while, you, you probably are. You're probably an introvert. <laughs> I appreciate that distinction. So, say that there's some people listening right now who would like to get in touch with you or maybe purchase a copy of your book. Where can they go? Well, uh, easiest place to go and the most appreciated place would be Amazon because, uh, you know, you can leave a review there. Uh, you just look up Randall Eldon Green, Descriptions of Heaven. I think right now Amazon even will pull up Descriptions of Heaven if that's all you type in. I appreciate that. Uh, when my book first came out, I think there were several religious tracks beforehand, and this isn't a religious book, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, if they want to get in touch with me, they can email me at wintergreenwriter at gmail.com. It's not spelled like my last name. My last name is G-R-E-E-N-E, wintergreenwriters, just like the color. And they can also go to authorgreen.com if you want to read some of my writing before you invest in this book. Uh, there's definitely links to anything I've had published online. You know, I recently had even a poem published. I, I said I'm not a poet, but... Dude, congrats. Um, yeah, I, I wrote a little vignette and then uh, realized that this is more of a prose poem than anything. An unbroken journal took it, which was really awesome of them. That's the second piece of mine they've accepted. So I'm like, ah, I'm feeling the love. Oh, congrats. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, definitely some short stories that they can check out, uh, see if they like the, the writing style. I can't guarantee it's all similar to Descriptions of Heaven. You know, I write a lot of different things, maybe read some of the five-star Amazon reviews, and then you can even read some of the, you know, two stars on there. That's totally fine, too. <laughs> How do you feel about those two-star reviews? You know, I just, it, it happens. I, I just don't take it personally, and I totally understand. Uh, the publisher gave away the book on Kindle for free for, like, four days, and it was up there number one in two different categories and then I'm looking at the other books in the categories and I'm like oh man a lot of people are buying this because of the book cover um, this is not a romance this mm. is not a religious title you know this cover has this angel the, made of stone and there's this streak of white paint coming down from a, a sun right there <laughs> it's, it's a really <laughs> interesting photo that Harvard shows there but I, I love it <laughs> I absolutely love it however you know, I do understand if people don't care for the book, if it's not their thing, that is okay. And if they feel compelled to give it a two-star rating, that's fine. But it's more appreciated if you read a lot of literary fiction. You know, if you're just reading genre fiction, I'll never give a young adult book or a fantasy book or a sci-fi book any star rating because my opinion really doesn't count. I don't read enough of that to know what's good and know what's not. My expectations are something completely different. That's fair. What are your expectations uh, for a good book when you're reading? Oh, for a good book when I'm reading, I, I want to learn at least one new word, please. Um, I, I Maybe that's just the logo file and me coming out. I, I don't know. Uh, I expect some sort of um, uh, poetic aesthetic. Uh, Sort which of rhymes, rhymes which is appropriate. <laughs> um, I, and then I also like, um, you know, ideas and themes without the soapbox. Mm. I cannot stand the soapbox, and I could tear down some very popular authors who I feel like uh, like to stand up and proselytize a little bit, whether they're proselytizing some sort of moral or anarchy. Mm. Maybe you know who I'm talking about. Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't care for that. That's not really the author's job. The mm. author's job is to tell a story, um, not to pitch a position. If the characters have a position, fine. <laughs> they will have a position of their real people and flawed people as they should be. But uh, 
you know, what, what I'm looking for is a, a mesh, a weave of ideas, you know, uh, the more strands I can pull out, uh, you know, looking at it critically, just the more I'm going to love the book. What a wonderful way of saying that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what do you love most about writing? Oh, what do I love most about writing? It can be more than one thing. Oh, yeah, there, there is so much <laughs> I love about writing. You know, the, the act of creative genesis is it's just wonderful. I think it's one of those um, innate human things, creativity and um, storytelling on top of that is one of those things we do uh, as humans. And whether you're making films or writing books um, or even telling jokes, which is another form of storytelling itself, uh, you know, being able to participate in this so human thing, this thing that is in entirely, um, well, entirely human, evolved, we're evolved to create. And I think whenever I get the realization, I'm participating in that. I'm not a passive act, you know, I'm not a passive person. I'm, I'm an active actor, um, you know, just tingles. <laughs> I can tell that because your face is like lighting up when you're saying that. So <laughs> I love writing too. And, and I, I like that you say that it's just part of who we are. This is Wonderful and lovely. I'm so glad that you reached out to me. I'm so happy I get to meet you. Well, thank you. You you followed me on Twitter first, I have Did to say. I? That's how I discovered you. I had no idea. Sometimes I'm like, oh, they have writer in their bio. I'm going to follow them. <laughs> what a happy accident. I'm so pleased. Thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you.